Elijah Rock. Elijah Rock. Shout, shout. Elijah Rock. Elijah Rock. Coming up alone. Elijah Rock. Elijah Rock. Shout, shout. Elijah Rock. Elijah Rock. Coming up alone. Elijah Rock. Shout, shout. Elijah Rock. Elijah Rock. Coming up alone. Elijah Rock. Shout, shout. Elijah Rock. Elijah Rock. Coming up alone. Elijah Rock. Shout, shout. Elijah Rock. Coming up alone. Elijah Rock. Shout, shout. Elijah Rock coming up alone. Elijah, 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 shout, shout. Elijah Rock coming up alone. back to the second segment of talking about the evidences of the Bible. The Christians that meet in high desert are very excited to be able to bring the second segment to you. You might remember what we talked about in the first segment, that science does not contradict the Bible. That there was some ancient truths within the Bible, that there was no way that ancient man could understand those scientific truths, yet the Bible did not make scientific mistakes. It was correct in everything it said and does not contradict science. And we talked about some of those things last week. And this week we're going to continue on in talking about some more evidences that we have to know that the Bible is from God. There's no way that this Bible can be a product of mankind. Mankind is too fallible. And there's no way that they could put together something so perfect and so full of truth. And this is what we're going to be continuing on today. But please don't forget, we also have assembly times where we meet in the chapel in all the different yards in High Desert, and we hope to meet you and to see you there, and you can have questions, and we'd be more than happy to talk about the faith in Jesus Christ. But as we continue this section today, Rick, what is it that we're going to be talking about today? Today we're going to talk about the archaeological and historical evidences that support the validity of the Bible. Hey, check this out. We'll be right back. Hermanos y amigos, ¿Por qué no estás a las reuniones de los cristianos en High Desert? Ponte trucha. Ven a las reuniones. La Iglesia de Cristo está en Yarda A todos lunes al 1 en la tarde y en Yarda B en la mañana a las 9 todos jueves. Ven, ven y escucha las palabras de Jesucristo de la revelación de la Biblia. Ven, bienvenido a todo. Gracias. Many believe that the Bible is a collection of mythical stories, but it is, in fact, a narrative of the history of God's uh, interaction with real men and a real God. And through archaeology, we have uh, confirmed all the peoples, places, and times of the Bible. Does modern archaeology confirm the biblical narrative? And that's an important question, but why is it an important question? Well, Brett, I think the reason it's important is because of this. If the Bible is false, that means the names are false, the places are false, and the times are false, and the cultural references are false, and they're all mixed up, then we would know for sure that it's not from God, because God doesn't make mistakes like that. Take, for example, William Shakespeare. He may be a good read, but every Italian knows that Willie never spent any time in Italy. Because as you go through his plays and his stories, what you see is that he had no idea where places were in Italy. He would have a city in Italy in the wrong place, north of something where it's actually south. And so when we study it and read it, we know that William Shakespeare is fiction and that he had never been to Italy. But we don't find that with the Bible. Instead, what we find is just the opposite. We find that there are no inaccuracies in the Bible and that all the places and the names and the times and the cultural references are true and that there are no mistakes about these things. It was not written to be a historical book, but all the historical events that take place in it can be confirmed by archaeology. An example of what Dan is talking about 
is that the 19th century was a time of uh, archaeological expeditions all over the world. Edward Robinson and Eli Smith made two different trips to Palestine in 1838 and 1852. They were able to identify hundreds of biblical sites that were previously unknown. And the way they did this was simply to look at what the Bible had to say and compare that to what they were seeing around them. And the result of that was two different volumes of biblical researches in Palestine in 1841 and 1856. And Robinson is considered by many to be the father of biblical archaeology. Hey, you know, Brett, the other thing that I understand is that many cities mentioned in the Palestine area were only noted in the Bible before this guy Robinson went out in the 1800s. And Rick, what were some of those cities that they discovered later on after the, they were looking in the area and they, the Bible had talked about them, but they didn't have any record of them? But then later on with the archaeologists following the Bible, they found some of those cities. What are some of those cities that they had? Well, three of those cities were Jericho, Ur, and Nineveh. But modern archaeology has uh, discovered those the city sites and uh, proven that they do exist, and they're not mythical. Exactly. And that's, once again, how we know that the Bible is true. You know, I think it's interesting that the maps that they might have had before Robinson went out, wouldn't have even had these cities on a map. But now they're put back on it because the Bible spoke about it and people went out and found these. I would say that this is an important point. That's right, Dane. And what's really fascinating is that the principal source that archaeologists use to search for these cities is the Bible. The question then comes, well, do archaeology and the Bible ever disagree? Well, you know, sometimes it's seen that way. But only later evidence shows that the Bible was right all the time. It is a fool indeed who argues against the biblical narrative. Such was the case in the early 19th century concerning the Hittite people. The Hittites are people mentioned in Scripture in the Old Testament, but most scholars at that time thought it was an invention of biblical writers and that that nation and that culture really did not exist some thought that the scribes had made a mistake and what they meant to write was the Assyrian people. But guess what? In 1876, a British scholar, A.H. Sace, saw inscriptions carved in Turkey and he thought about them and he was familiar with the Bible and he supposed them to be the Hittites. But he didn't have time to go and prove it then. Later on, a German, Hugo Winkler, began his own expedition based upon Sace's discoveries in 1906. In Winkler's excavations, he uncovered five temples, a fortified citadel, and several massive sculptures. In one storeroom alone, he found over 10,000 clay tablets. One of the documents proved to be a record of a treaty between, between Ramses II and the Hittite king. Other tablets showed that there was the capital of the Hittite kingdom, and its original name was Hatshua, and the city covered an area of 300 acres. That doesn't sound like a figment of an imagination, does it? The Hittite nation had been discovered. Oh, no, wait a second. The Bible had already talked about it. It hadn't been discovered. It had been there the whole time. The biblical text was right. Archaeology had to catch up to the Bible. In fact, when you think about it, you read the books of Isaiah, you read the prophets, you read the books of history, chronicles, kings, the time of 1st and 2nd Samuel. You have thousands of places and names and dates that are given. And so far every one of those has been true time and time again in spite of what historians might have thought. There's no errors in places or events or kings. and to this day, many people glean their starting points for archaeological discovery from the Bible. Let me give an example of what Brett is talking about here. There's quite a bit of detail when Jeremiah starts off his book. He mentions a lot of people. He mentions a lot of places. Here's what it says in Jeremiah, the first chapter, beginning in verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, 
the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. There's all kinds of detail given within these biblical records, and nowhere do we ever find them mistaking or being off time, or mistaking a place, or mistaking a king. The biblical account is always correct. It's a lot different than what we have in our society today. Here's a couple of books of history. Oh, this is the third edition. Third edition? Because the first was not perfect. And they needed to have some other editions besides the first one. Here's another one, the third edition. Guess what? When God wrote the Bible, there was one edition because he wrote it perfectly and without mistakes. He didn't need to go back and revise it to make up for the mistakes he made in the past. Can this be a product of man? No. This third edition is a product of man. The complete record of the Bible without mistakes has got to be the product of God. It's got to be. Consider that. We'll be back shortly to continue this study. Hey guys, we're not late for chapel yet, are we? What time is it? Well, since you're arriving, we must be late. <laughs> it must be. <laughs> we want to encourage you to come and be with us in our Bible studies at the chapel. On Thursdays, we're in A yard at 9 a.m., and we're at C Yard at 10.30 a.m. A scheduled time of meeting in B Yard is at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Hey, and don't forget D Yard is also 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Thursdays. And then there's also a Spanish-speaking meeting in B Yard on Thursdays at 9 o'clock. And another Spanish-speaking meeting in A Yard at 1 o'clock on Mondays. We hope to see you there. We're preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and we know He wants to save you. Amen. The next point that we want to consider as we look at how the Bible is verified as true is contextual integrity. Contextual integrity? What does that mean, Brett, contextual integrity? As you think about ancient writings, we kind of verify the truth behind those ancient writings by how much documentation exists concerning them, how many manuscripts exist to verify what one person says or another. And so we do the same with the Bible. We look for how much documentation is there in ancient writings and manuscripts. So it's kind of like having more witnesses at a scene exactly. than just a few. Exactly. So when you look at ancient writings, for instance, Caesar's Gaelic Wars was written between 58 and 50 BC. There's only 10 good copies which survive today. And the newest of those is still 900 years after that. Of the original 14 books of histories written by the Roman historian Tacitus in 100 AD, there's only four and a half copies which survive today, and two of those are not complete. Of the 16 books annals, 10 survive in full, and two partial copies exist today. The earliest of those copies, though, is 800 A.D. So let me see if I get this straight. What you're telling me is that when Julius Caesar was writing about the Gallic Wars, that the earliest copy we have is 900 years after these events he's talking about. And the ones that Tacticus was writing down, the earliest copies we have of those are 800 years after these events. Exactly. And, and how many copies do we have of Gallic Wars from Julius Caesar? Only ten. Ten, that's it. And in more recent times, our own Declaration of Independence, were, there were only 500 original copies, but only 25 survive to this day. And yet, we would not deny that the Declaration of Independence was written and exists. Yeah, I guess not. On the 4th of July, I'm eating a hot dog. How about you? <laughs> So I guess we all believe that it exists, even though there's only 25 copies, original copies, that we still have in existence. Well, the Bible is the best documented book in history. And this is the point we're trying to make. With thousands of ancient manuscripts available to our translators to confirm that the Bible message is exactly what it says. The New Testament alone has over 5,000 Greek original manuscripts to compare and contrast. And guess what they find is that they're all saying the same thing. 
that it is the first edition. The earliest manuscript we have is from about 130 A.D. Did you catch that? 130 A.D. Julius Caesar was writing about things, and the earliest copy we have was 900 years after these events. We have a copy, an original copy, that's only about 100 years after the death of Jesus. And more than that, only about 40 years after the death of the last apostle. 40 years. I have a book right here. It's Winston Churchill's record of World War II. And this particular one was printed in 1950. This book is older than the relationship of that copy to the last living apostle. This would actually be similar to our own history. And we consider the war in Vietnam, which ended in the early 1970s we actually have copies of biblical manuscripts which are more recent to the life of the Apostle John than we do our own history concerning the Vietnam War. In examination we see the Bible is not just one book but a collection of books, 66 books in fact written by over 40 authors over a period of about 1500 years. And here's the amazing thing is that all of these books show perfect continuity. They all agree, all these different authors. Now, some of these writers were fishermen, some were warriors, some were farmers. You know, some were religious leaders, national leaders, and shepherds. Some were kings, tax collectors, and judges. And some were highly educated, like the Apostle Paul, while others barely educated at all, like Peter, who was a fisherman. Yet with these differences, the prophecies, laws, ceremonies, and histories all run together. How can that be? How can that be? Have you ever played the phone game? This is how the phone game works. You have like ten people in a room sitting in a circle. And you have a message and you write it down so that you know what the original message was. But you don't show any of the other people the original message. And you hide that message, and then the first person whispers in the ear of the first person in line what the message they want transferred around this room, the original message. People keep whispering to the next one, whispering to the next one, so nobody else can hear it except in the first person telling the next person, and the next person telling the next person. No one else can hear it. By the time it gets around to the end of the room, or the tenth person, in 15 minutes... That message is so changed that you can't even recognize the original message or who changed it or when. You don't really know. How can this be the product of men through 1,500 years of writing, 40 different authors, and still have the same message? That's what we're talking about with contextual integrity. We can't even get the same message in one day in one room with 10 humans. How were they able to do this? They didn't do it. One God did it, who is above all, and in us all, and through all. He's the one that compiled this book for us, and it's clear evidence that this is something of divine origin, and not of mankind's origin. Just wrapping up here and concluding this segment, don't forget what we've talked about. A lot of people are trying to say that people have messed with the Bible, and got involved with it, and so it's not true, and it's not the original record of God. But we already know it's from God because there are no mistakes in it. There's no second or third or fourth edition where people go back and correct the historical mistakes or getting a historical name wrong. No, it's all correct and it reflects the divine nature of God and the divine providence of Him putting this record together. And also the contextual integrity of this book. How is it that people are not disagreeing with one another? Hey, get ready for the next presidential election. People are disagreeing all the time. Here's 40 authors through 1,500 years who do not disagree, do not contradict, in fact, all agree with the message. That's amazing. That can't be of mankind. It has got to be of God. If anyone's telling you different, don't believe that. Look at the evidence that's here before you. Nobody denies Caesar. Nobody denies what Tacticus was talking about. Nobody denies the Declaration of Independence. And yet we have more evidence about what the Bible has said from the original time than any of these other works in history. That's an amazing thing to us. We're hoping to see you again 
and we're hoping to have some more segments in this TV segment, and we're glad that you were able to join us this day. And we have our whole crew here with us today. We didn't have Brett on our last segment, and we're glad to have him this time. And Brett, what are we going to be looking at at our next segment? The next time we get together, we're actually be going to be considering the prophecy of Scripture and how it verifies the truth of the Bible. And this is more than just, here's a prophecy in Scripture and we find it confirmed in the record of Scripture. We're actually going to be seeing that God's prophecies often relate historical facts that are verified in our, by our secular historians as well. And so that's what we're going to be looking at next time. I would think, Brett, that with prophecy, it's got to be the ultimate evidence that this is from God. I don't know people that can foretell the future. I mean, sometimes I see people that are saying, oh yeah, Nostradamus did the future, or predicted the future, or Jules Verne, or somebody like that. But I think what we're going to see with God's prophecy is they have a very different nature than what you read in your horoscope. I can guarantee you about that. So we're finishing up this segment today, but don't forget... We have a time to come and meet with us in the chapel. We'd love to see you there. And we'd love to see you there not to just see you, but to also to teach you the words of life through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. We want everyone to know about the only way of salvation through His name. Don't hesitate. Don't leave your soul in jeopardy one more day. Come and be with us in the chapel and let us teach you the good news of Jesus Christ, that you can be saved. Regardless of the things that you've done in the past, the biggest thing that's happened in the past is the cross of Jesus Christ and the shedding of His blood. And that's what will be able to save you. Hope to see you soon. Elijah Rock, Elijah Rock shout, shout. Elijah Rock, Elijah Rock coming up alone. Elijah Rock, Elijah Rock shout, shout. Elijah Rock, Elijah Rock coming up alone. Elijah, Elijah Rock. Rock. Shout, shout, Elijah Rock, Elijah Rock coming up alone. Elijah, Elijah Rock, shout, shout, Elijah Rock, Elijah Rock coming up alone. Elijah, 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 Elijah Rock, shout, shout, Elijah Rock coming up alone. Elijah Rock, shout, shout, Elijah Rock coming up alone. Elijah.